Welcome to Ask the Manager. We haven't had a show for a couple of months. Life got in our way, but we're back. And now the poor town manager has to listen to me once again. And I'd like to start with talking about COVID because we were really headed in a nice downward trend. We were down to as low as 31 cases in a week. Mm -hmm. And this past week we were up to 54. Yeah. And I was wondering if the um, Board of Health gave you any insight to that. No, nothing yet. Um, certainly, we've come off our low numbers of um, kind of the early to mid-March, uh, where we are on the, the steady decline, um, and we've started to ramp back up a little bit. It is following that kind of nervous trend that you're hearing about in the media with this BA2 variant. and um all those other things so um we're cautiously monitoring it and um hopefully it doesn't you know continue to escalate because if it would it may mean we need to retract some of the openness that we have so um we're definitely keeping our eye on it but no specific areas of concerns or other indications from the board of health at this point so at this point things in schools remain the same right um, and the Council on Aging has opened up. Yes. Yep. So will, if the numbers go up, will that have an impact on the activity at the Council on Aging? It would. Um, the senior center? Yeah, the only, you know, potentially good part if the numbers are going up, you know, the weather is nicer so we could quickly move to outside activities. But, um, yeah, we're, we're holding in uh, this pattern for now, but if we start to see maybe even... You know, we had 50 some cases last week. If that number would, you know, get 50% higher or double, then I think we'd start to have to reconsider where we are with regards to our operating status and what's open and what requires masking and things like that. How has the attendance been at the senior center since you've opened back up? Are people coming in or are they cautiously staying away? Um, I don't know the full details, to be honest with you, but. Um, it seems like the general trend is people are coming back. You know, not all at once. It's not a return to normal, but, you know, slow and steady. People are resuming activities. It seems like people are anxious to get back to normal. Mm -hmm. And I just hope that as they're making that attempt to get to normalcy, that they're still cautious. Right. There are still things that people can do to remain cautious and still be out and socializing and so forth. Yeah. Um, and with the weather getting nice, people are just, you know, excited to be outside. Mm -hmm. I know the person I live with is outside all the time. It's like a little kid, you're finally <laughs> letting him out to play. So, you no, know, my husband's very happy with the nice weather and getting yard work done again. Yeah. Um, that's his idea of fun. I'll pass. <laughs> but um, what about masks? Do you have to wear a mask in town hall? No, um, no masking requirements at this point in any public buildings. Um, certainly individuals at their own discretion can wear it. And obviously if there's cold-like symptoms or you know, following CDC guidance of what they're saying with regards to positive cases after five days um, and negative tests, yes. But um, yeah, it's been, you know, we still certainly see plenty of folks wearing masks when they come into the building being cautious, which is great. And so flu season is still here. Allergy season is starting up. So I know it's really kind of funny if you hear someone cough and you're in a public space, everybody kind of runs away. Mm -hmm. So even in innocence, you know, right. it doesn't have to be that they have COVID, but that, that fear remains. Right. And with springtime, there are an awful lot of potholes. So is the highway department busy with the pothole oh, yeah. repair? Yeah, I mean, I think this is an average to above average year with potholes. Um, we are finally able to get a consistent and steady supply of asphalt, which isn't available, you know, conveniently available throughout the entire winter. You know, only a few plants stay open, um, but we're getting more consistent and getting to all the areas of concern as soon as we can. So it's definitely part of the core tasks week in and week out at this point of the season. So, and then our bigger summer repaving and larger uh, repair projects will begin happening in the coming weeks, you know, or for late spring. And when you talk about repair projects, there's um, work 
being done? Has it started at the top of Howe Ave with the pump station? Uh, it has not started yet. Um, we'll, we are, the Board of Selectmen granted a road closure um, because of, it's at, a, it's at a bad spot right there on the corner. So uh, traffic is only going to be one way on Howe Avenue uh, to provide some protection to the workers. But uh, that project will get underway in the in the coming weeks. And, and how long will that last? I think it's a eight week project, eight to ten weeks. Pretty big. Last. Yeah. Yep. And when we talk about pump stations, of course, at the beginning of February there was the big pump station failure city of Worcester. into the lake with the city of Worcester. What can you tell us about that? Yeah. Um, you know, these pump stations are inconveniently. Um, placed along some of the lowest spots geographically or topographically in any community. Um, you'll notice even along the lake on our side, we have Harvey Place, which is you know just down the road from here that's located because you flowed sewer to the lowest part and then pumped it to wherever it was needed to go. It's kind of the most efficient way to do it. And you know that was kind of the trend that was done through the mid 1900s and um, so we're left with that infrastructure. Unfortunately, in the city of Worcester situation, there was a series of uh, failures and they, for some reason, didn't tw trigger any external alarms. Um, so um, pumps thought that they were operating under normal conditions and continuing to flow sewer through the pump station. And actually they were filling a temporary holding well and then that well began to overflow without any uh, alarm being sent out centrally uh, all of our pump stations and i'm sure that city of worcester pump station is set up with what's called a SCADA system that if there's a high water mark or anything like that that's achieved uh, an alarm goes off and notifies uh, critical staff for some reason, those alarms failed. Whether it was because of an electrical matter that you know over, you know started or uh, preceded uh, the actual sewer overflow or not, I haven't heard yet. But um, there are plenty of redundancies in place on our side to prevent a situation like that from like happening. Like you test the alarm yeah. Yeah. regularly, right? On and a multiple schedule. alarms on different aspects of the system. I'm not saying we're immune from it. Um, yeah, we don't want to jinx us. Yeah, but um, it did seem like um, an irregular failure, right? Like some uh, a series of events happened that you wouldn't expect to have happened, and that's what caused such a large failure of that system. But again, it's... It's not their first failure. Right. I mean, it seems like yeah. it's happened pretty regularly. Right. I'm wondering, would the state step in Absolutely. because of it being such a large mm -hmm. waterway to help the city move it get it away from the lake it doesn't really have to be there with today's technology right it'd be a a massive undertaking to move it given the amount of flow that goes through that pump station on lake ave in worcester um, like i said throughout the better part of a century or, or more than a century that was the system that was set up so to undo that it would be quite significant again pretty much everything as they say everything flows downhill right yeah so that's you know what happens there the, the sewer flows to that station and then out towards the upper blackstone um, treatment plant so it'd be a significant undertaking for them to to move it away from there it's not impossible but um probably likely not on their capital plan they look to just fortify that system dep is involved anytime there is a sanitary sewer overflow you have to notify them pretty low threshold the amount of sewer certainly um the city of Worcester has worked with DEP since this has happened, and I'm sure they'll make improvements to prevent it from happening in the future. But just under six million gallons of yep. sewerage went into our lake. Absolutely. And I mean, if it had been summertime, that would have been pretty cat bad enough. But yep. in the summertime, it would have been catastrophic. Absolutely. Um, I I would hope that DEP would somehow do an evaluation to see if that pump station could be moved since there have been so many failures mm -hmm. you know it's not just that there was a failure mm -hmm. it's it's I, i've lost count now but mm -hmm. it seems that we would hear about it pretty regularly mm -hmm. um, so that's just my little piece of two cents on that one mm -hmm. um, but now it's the, that water is tested and the, oh, yeah. and i think i heard the person um, at the lake 
Quinn Sigamon Commission meeting talking about the testing being done and that it's the water is okay now. Oh, absolutely, yeah. So it did take, given the cold temperatures of the water and the flows with it being ice covered, it did take quite some time, several weeks for it to um, be safe to resume, you know, what have been normal activities in the summer, but it is, you know, the water quality is back to that level at this point. So um, while we're on water quality, Old Mill Pond, mm -hmm. um, does that pond get ignored or when I say ignored, is enough done to keep that water pristine in that area? And I know there's something about a weed study being mm -hmm. done at yeah. Old Mill right now, yeah. but is enough being done because that's really a hidden jewel, mm -hmm. I think, in that town, even though many cars pass it all, every day. Right. Yeah, so I mean, um, we are looking to probably overcome some challenges that have occurred there. Um, there is some extra weed growth, and it seems like the floor, you know, the, the bottom has, you know, quite amount of sediment in it. Um, there is a small dam or inlet that goes under Old Mill Road and heads uh, toward uh, Lake Quinsigamond. Um, I think that from a general standpoint, this isn't necessarily um, just with Old Mill Pond, but the ponds that get the most attention are those that have some type of formalized group of abutters associated with it that, you know, um, collectively either contribute dollars or just cooperation among themselves to kind of maintain and watch the waterway. I had a conversation with some residents, actually some uh, young uh, middle school age and elementary age students that live on that uh, body of water asking for some help from the town to undertake some of the activities that we are undertaking. So I think the, the group is kind of noticing the, the deterioration and asking for our help now. Uh, and we hope to work with them in the future. You know, the same thing really happened in Newton Pond where uh, the residents you know, came together. They actually raised some funds on their own as well, but to preserve, you know, their asset living on a body of water. So I think that's always a really important thing. Um, helps keep it on our radar, um, and residents can reach out to us with a unified voice of all the abutters associated with it. So, to directly answer your question, probably over the years, yes. You know, some extra sediment and uh, infiltration into that body of water, nutrification from fertilizers and things like that. And the, that combination really, you know, puts weeds in, they die, it raises the, you know, the, the bottom. It seems that not too long ago, Old Mill Pond was drained. Mm -hmm. And then it was drained for too long mm -hmm. while um, the weeds were taken out. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would hope that we could maybe get all of the waterways on some sort of schedule where I know you, they follow the weeds and the types mm -hmm. of weeds and they talk about the weeds and I don't know what they're talking about, but mm -hmm. um, it would be good if there was just some sort of a cyclical mm -hmm. um, program to address them before they get out of control. Well, one of the changes that we do plan to make at this year's town meeting when we fund these activities is, you know, historically we've asked town meeting to dedicate the money uh, to Lake Quinsigamond uh, Association um, in that watershed. And that's probably where the vast majority of our funds will go in the future, but we're not going to ask town meeting to be that specific with the appropriation any longer. We're going to ask it to be appropriated for water quality uh, in lakes and waterways in Shrewsbury. And then um, Historically, it's been through Angela Snell and the you know Public Facilities Department, um, and you know her staff in public in parks that have looked at other town water bodies and worked at the Conservation Commission to um, identify things outside of Lake Quinsigamon that needs to be addressed. So, taking a little bit broader approach, we hopefully will have more flexibility with our funding in the coming years to be able to meet some of those uh, needs outside of Lake Quinn Sigmund itself. So, so would Angela Snell be the person who, uh, or her, her yep. role would be the role to manage those funds and Yeah, decide? really in conjunction with conservation, uh, the conservation agent, so yeah. 
And who's that conservation agent? Um, currently, right now, Brad Stone staffs uh, conservation. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, if you drive around Route 9, you notice that a lot of the poles, even up the center of town, look like the paint is peeling off those new poles. Mm. And that's all state property, right? Is it the state's job to maintain that? because they're starting to really deteriorate. I don't think so. I think those were installed by Selco and it'd be something that we would have to manage. It would be Selco? Yeah. Oh, because... Yeah. Even though if it's along a state roadway, normally any decorative or ornamental features like that are locally owned. Okay, because yeah. all, it seems like everywhere you stop, mm -hmm. you, if you look at those poles, at first, when the poles were brand new, everyone would go crazy because people would put tape up and you're say about traffic posts no they're not traffic they're posts decorative they're decorative lamps they're, yeah. they're decorative yeah. the black ones yeah and and so people would put their signs up saying mm -hmm. yard sale and and put it right on a brand new pole mm -hmm. you know but they're peeling much higher than where the mm -hmm. signs go mm -hmm. so the damage isn't strictly from tape it's just that sure. it's just not adhering to the, the salt yeah you think that's yeah. even high? Yeah, I mean, it works its way up, sucks Phew. its way up the metal. Wow. Yeah. So, um, with um, COVID, how is the town doing with local receipts? Um, local receipts are really strong. They're on more on pace with, you know, last fiscal year, which was about $13.1 million. So, uh, we're really consistent through the end of March in that. I'm very pleased to see it. We're actually a little a couple hundred thousand ahead of where we were last year at this time. So um, that would really kind of solidify the, the pattern and strength of local receipts in my mind, much stronger than they had been. Uh, this year we only budgeted about 10.8 million in estimated receipts, and I think we should come in somewhere around 13 again. So it's a, it's a, it's nice a strong buffer. number. Yeah. Good. Um, that's, you know, marijuana excise plays into that a little bit. Um, a lot. But, um, yeah, because we, we weren't very aggressive in budgeting that. But we have seen receipts return and exceed where they were even pre-pandemic levels on meals tax and motor vehicle excise tax. So um, that's been good. Well, Tavern in the Square must be a major contributor because that parking lot's full constantly. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if it's lunchtime, long after lunchtime, mm -hmm. but that lot is always full. Uh, so, so there's a small business grant program, and there's $50,000 in that, but not one small business gets the $50,000. Right. They, the most they can get is 2500 That's right. Uh, small businesses applying for those? Uh, we've had, yeah, more than 10 applications so far. I think the, well, no, I think the program closed at the end of March. Uh, we'll see uh, what those applications are like and determine if we think we missed any business areas um, that we would expand it to, um, see what the level of the applications are and the financial need is, um, and determine whether we want to extend the application period maybe increase the award um, you know I had been talking with staff and said well you know if, if we think that's everyone that's you know going to apply and everyone's showing 20 or thirty thousand dollars in financial hardship and we're only given 2500 maybe we increase our award amount and extend and allow more people to apply so uh, $2,500 is more than any other grant that we've ever given to small businesses. It's not something we do, uh, but maybe folks um, just, you know, didn't think it was worth their time or didn't have the opportunity to apply. So it's not our goal to keep the money. It's our goal to distribute the funds. So we're going to reconsider that program once all the applications are reviewed. And where did that money come from? Uh, the American Rescue Plan Act. So the federal, the largest, the larger federal stimulus so program. is that part of the 11.5 million it yep. so it, it's part of the 11.5 million dollars that shrewsbury's received correct but we haven't received all of that money anyhow no we received half of it yeah we, we expect the second half to come in this uh, july or august and when that money comes in do you have a plan for that well yeah we have an, a number of plans we would go back to departments potentially and and see what else has come up uh we would um, adopt second rounds of programs like this grant application or add more funding into other programs that we did. 
we got a real benefit. Uh, the federal government, when they wrote the interim rule, they allowed the first 10 million that any city or town received to be revenue loss. So we have great flexibility in using that, but it's only one-time revenue. So we just want to be smart about how we use it. So um, one of the programs that the Board of Selectmen has talked about at their recent meetings um, was the fact that we put the renovation of the town hall on hold um, because of the pandemic. And uh, of the 11 and a half million in plan, as far as what we've planned for, we've only identified the use of, um, well, we have about $7 million left that we haven't planned for the use of. So um, this could be an unprecedented opportunity to make some capital improvements to the town hall still, um, despite having to put that on hold because of the pandemic. So we're gonna do a little bit of investigation into some design work. Um, I don't know how long it's been since folks have been to the town hall, but um, as we're building services and staffing levels, we're cannibalizing the space on the inside and taking away conference space, um, despite the need for conference space. So, we're, so the we're original, really out of room. the original selectmen's meeting room, right? Which is you walk in the front door and you take a right. That's right. And it's on the right. That was also a voting place for um, precinct two. That's right. Now precinct two voters will be voting at the senior center, which is no big deal. Mm -hmm. It's it's right there. What offices went into that selectman's meeting room and how did you accomplish that? Yeah, so two thirds, so space was divided, basically one third, two third, uh, with uh, our um, maintenance staff and uh, public buildings uh, did all the construction work themselves. Um, a third of it was allocated to the Board of Health administrative staff, um, and then the other two thirds was allocated to the school department for their front office, central office staff. So um, it's, you know, just. And you're still full. Yeah, we're still full. Yep. Um, You've rearranged um, the town manager's office suite. Yep. And it was interesting because there was this little cubby room that was, when I first became a selectman. It was the selectman's office, mm -hmm. and then that got eliminated years ago and put into your office, and now you've got a total reorganization of your office staff, mm -hmm. and you've made a reasonably good-sized suite right. there, which made perfect sense, especially if you look looked at how you set it up it, yeah. it, it's done it's amazing that you were able to accomplish that in that space right. and still have room for all those offices yeah so you've you've um added space mm -hmm. within your space yeah we've we, yeah for the board of selectmen and town manager's office we took down a wall um and created one additional private office but we kind of opened the whole area up um gave us more room and that's really to accommodate human resources staff. Like that's the biggest change in the town manager's office that um, really required those changes to be made. The second assistant town manager is within that suite area now. So um, yeah, it's kind of, we're running out of creative ways to find more space. Um, and you know, as the town grows and staff grows, we need to have some place to house them and not just do that by eating up conference space which is the approach that we've taken so far and you plan to do all this through the it started out to be a municipal municipal campus right. committee then it became the police station committee and now it's going back to being more of a municipal campus committee it is right with that building committee in place and the fact that we just wanted to a wonderful building committee might i ask yeah <laughs> i'm on it <laughs> so um since we have that building committee in place and basically we want to do about fifty thousand dollars or so worth of design work we didn't want to create another building committee so um we'll work the scope of work that we originally put in place with the architect and the OPM for the police station, as you said, was municipal campus wide. So we have that freedom and ability to go back in and revise their contract again um, and do just a couple more design iterations for the town hall. The building committee originally uh, presented to the Board of Selectmen one concept, which included a second story addition over the kind of the Selco wing of the town hall. So. Um, that's, 
I think it was the most prudent approach at the time, but it's very disruptive. We'd have to find alternative space for everyone that would be on that first floor. So it'd be disruptive. And we just wanted to see if there's a couple other options that may be lower in cost and less disruptive. We could keep everyone in their offices for the most part. So to me, it makes sense that you go in with a plan for the police station. Okay, that's done. Mm -hmm. The town's addressed that. Then you address town hall, and then you still have to address the senior center mm -hmm. for what needs to be done there. But I think it adds value to the project if you keep them somewhat separate mm -hmm. so that the focus is on that and you do the best you can. Instead of just doing a halfway job, mm -hmm. you do it right the first time. Mm -hmm. And so I think it'll be more beneficial to do it in steps mm -hmm. and in increments as opposed to we're going to do this, this, and this. And you think, oh my God, look at all that money. And, right. and now you're cutting corners and you're not doing it the right way. Mm -hmm. And I mean, right now, we, I, I do believe we have probably the most beautiful town hall in, in the country, not just in the state of Massachusetts, mm -hmm. based on mm -hmm. the limited number of states that I've been to. Mm -hmm. um, I'm always looking at schools and where's their town hall and what does their post office look like? And it's amazing to mm -hmm. see how some municipalities um, treat their municipal buildings. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think it's beneficial that we'll finish what we're doing with our focus on the police station mm -hmm. and move to the next step. I think that's yeah. actually a nice way of doing it. No, I know a lot of people or some people throughout the whole course of this study of the whole campus said, why don't we keep the police station? Um, that, that, that building from inside to outside, top to bottom is a cement block structure so remember it's a police station with jail cells and fortified dispatch center um, very limited drywall on the inside it's all you know cement block and it's set up for a police station um, and it's just not conducive to a modern office environment no you know no or very few windows you know all those things even the chief's office is in an old garage you know the original building so right. Um, we, we looked at that in, into some very high level or very detailed aspects of it. It just would, you know, be extremely cost prohibitive. Again, a 1976, 75 uh, era building when it was originally built and then yeah. added on to. So um, and over 50 percent of the space right now is a garage, you know, to, you know, right. so um, or garage spaces. So. And, and we found that sometimes it's less expensive to mm -hmm. knock that building down and start over mm -hmm. because it's less money yep. to do it right. than to try to work within. Yeah, because as soon as you add more than 30, if, if you look at the value of the building and your improvements are gonna be 30% or greater of that value, the entire building has to be come up to code. So that building would require an elevator, that building would require you know, a number of additional restroom spaces, um, and uh, handicap accessibility throughout, which again, when you have cement walls or you know, cement block walls, it's just, you're messing with the structure of the building every move that you make. And then you weaken the structure because mm. where's the supporting yeah. walls when yeah. you're working with block? And it was the plan from the beginning, and it, 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 it sits only about 50 feet off the front of the new police station. So it's right. kind of an impediment to that building um, as designed as well. So. And the police station's coming along um, still on budget, right. which in today's every uh, groceries are up, everything's up. Yeah. Wherever you turn and they blame it on, you know, COVID, now they're blaming it on the war and they'll, they'll continue to blame, you know, for different reasons to have a reason to raise the price of something. We're lucky that we've been able to get all of the supplies to build the mm -hmm. police station within the not only just within the price range but that we we're able to get the supplies right. and that was good planning on yep. the part of the um yep. building crew I, yep. the architect the contractor yeah. etc yeah i mean i i think that's one of the the biggest parts of it is is that team that we put in place on these projects we really vet them and we've we do have 
a great history with Fontaine Brothers, who's our construction manager at risk. And one of the things that we get from that good working relationship is um, I think they become less opportunistic on a project by project basis to find ways to add change orders, right? I'm not an economist. I think some of this inflation is opportunistic inflation, right? If, mm -hmm. if my neighbor raises the price on a you know, loaf of bread, I'm gonna raise the price on a loaf of bread. Uh, I know there's still competitiveness, but there's a lot of opportunity to increase prices and find ways to say things cost more. Some of it's true, right? Obviously we know the gas price of gas is up, but you know, the price of gas went up to four something when you know oil was a dollar thirty a gallon and oil's ninety nine bucks a gallon and you and know. groceries were going up yeah. before the war started. Yeah. Yep. So. so I think having those long term relationships to get back on track with these contractors and really vetting them and finding out who they are, you know, architect, OPM, um, and construction manager. Well, you know, we build long-term relationships and it's less about how much money they make on a single project. It's more about the long-term relationship that we build with them for the future. So um, that doesn't guarantee anyone the next job with the town, but, but I just think it builds goodwill and these contractors have gone out and done everything that they could to source the products and maintain those prices based on the relationships that they have with their suppliers. So there's so many questions. Um, how is the plowing expense budget this winter? Um, it's it's average or a little bit above average, um, you know, for the last few years. So we, we've been pretty lucky. We haven't had to um, provide a lot more resources into snow and ice operations over the last few years. We are seeing a significant trend in the price of salt going up. Talk about inflation, it's gone up. Uh, double digit percentages over the last few years and we'll anticipate that happening again. So what will we do? We'll fill the salt shed at the end of this winter. We are when the price goes down. Yeah, you'll buy. Well, so we're, it, we're just using this year's prices and filling it to the top of the salt shed, knowing that in the fall, the prices will likely go up 10 or 20 more percent. Right. So where does the salt come from? Uh, I think this last supplier, the, most of it comes out of the city of Baltimore. They have a major, if you ever go down through their major salt supply down there, it comes in or it comes out of the Great Lakes region. Is that where it comes yeah. from? Oh, yeah. I thought it came out of the country. So it's from within the country. Yeah, most of it is. We've used, uh, um, at least our suppliers of recent years, um, maybe the Baltimore stuff American? comes in from overseas, <laughs> but yeah, that's where that's where it originates from in the country. And so, then you have to stop and say, so why would it go up so much? Yeah. Other than transporting it, why yeah. would it go up so much? Yeah, I think it's just that whole process. It's the cost of mining it from it being in the ground to getting it into our trucks. It's a lot of petroleum and wages and time and materials. Getting people to, get to drive. Here. Yeah. Yep. So. Um, Reserve fund transfers, when I was on the finance committee, it seemed like we were getting so many reserve fund transfers. Mm -hmm. um, and that was because you were budgeting very tight in anticipation mm -hmm. of you know what was going to come, mm -hmm. coming out of the 2008 recession and so forth. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of reasons. So um, is that still happening? Do you still have a lot of reserve fund transfers? No, so through the first nine months, we haven't used a penny of the reserve fund. And now that you're back on the finance committee, at least for a few Only months. Only for a couple months. <laughs> so I'll be careful what I say, but um, I would feel really silly if we asked for a nine and a half million dollar override and then I was coming to the finance committee asking for reserve fund transfers because it mean we didn't do our job in budgeting. Uh -huh. um, I think that before the end of the fiscal year, we're gonna have some, uh, some relatively modest challenges in a few departments that we will need some of the reserve fund for. But um, we didn't increase the reserve fund as a line item when we increased the, the um, budget. You know, in theory, you should have. It should always be a percentage of your total expenditures. But I didn't want to waste or use taxpayer dollars into reserve when we could just budget for it appropriately and with within all the other uh, departmental budgets. So yeah, we haven't had to rely upon it, but um, I would think as the years go forward, it might be a little bit more and more and as things, you know, 
inherently get tighter again. Um, but this year we're fine. This yeah. year we're yeah. okay. Yep. Um, do you have a plan? Um, are, are there opportunities to capture more revenue than what we've been getting? So, for example, recruiting um, businesses to come into Shrewsbury mm -hmm. to fill the open buildings, et cetera? Yeah, um, to some extent, I think there are. I mean, we're seeing a lot of interest in um, new construction, uh, not just residential, but also commercial, and that's more in the, more in the logistics facilities, like what's being built at Centec North, and you know, there's potential development similar to that. Um, well, one that's under permitting on Route 20, the other half of the Stony Hill residential development that was broken off, um, and then over uh, at the old Worcester Sand and Gravel, you know, another logistics facility. So these are massive buildings. Um, they have a pretty good impact on the tax rate um, as far as providing new growth. But that's where the, the main difference comes in. It's those actual new construction um, and new buildings. So for those that don't like new, you know, actual new buildings in town, it's part of what drives our new revenue. So it's something that we go after. But um, so if you look at you mentioned the old West <laughs> sand and gravel property and that it could be a logistics facility coming in there. Mm -hmm. um, you have an article for town meeting about that. That's right. Why? Yep. Um, because uh, we currently have a limitation on our limited industrial district um, that doesn't, according to the developers, work well with their modern requirements. One of those is, um, I think logically, when we put the zoning bylaws in place for warehouse and distribution or logistics facilities, we said, your doors have to be in the rear of the building. Well, more often than not, at the rear of the building is an adjacent residential uh, district. So mm -hmm. now they're saying, well, allow us by special permit, allow the planning board to decide, does it make more sense for it to go in the front or the rear? So that's the first change, to allow for a special permit to have um, the loading and unloading occur at the front of the building. And then the second is the height. So as um, these facilities become more mechanized and artificial intelligence and robots are operating them, the height inside is going up and um, they're, the operators of them are asking for more clear span height, so that's the distance from the floor to any mechanical systems or anything like that. So as that goes up, then of course the exterior height goes up. So we currently limit that to 50 feet right now, and the plan is to have anything over 50 feet be able to be permitted through the planning board through a special permit as well. So it's, just trying to keep up and be competitive. Uh, some other towns are much more um, aggressive with the changes they're making to their zoning bylaws, making it up to 75 feet by right, and then a special permit on top of that. Um, but I think we'll end up closer to just implementing the, the special permit over 50 feet. So when did these facilities turn into the name logistics? Probably and what does when, that actually mean? Well, I mean, they're just. They're, it it they're doesn't like a, say if you if you're on the highway, the trucks are so and so logistics. It's not so and so trucking yeah, anymore. It's just they're Amazon. Logistics. Yeah, it's that, I mean, <laughs> that's, all that's, trucks. that's all it really is. You yeah. know, I I don't know who coined the term logistics, logistics. but it's it's not a long term warehouse, right? Yeah. Things don't stay there forever. Mm -hmm. That stuff turns over so frequently. But it's really, you know, it's in and out, and I don't know what the average lifespan is, but that's what it's really for. It's it's part of the hub of this um, distribution network that all these online retailers use to be able to get it to you in two days. So just stay with the old Worcester sand and gravel property. If that turns into a logistics facility on that property, what kind of tax dollars will that bring? What kind of revenue to the town? Well. I, because that's what matters. Yeah, from what I re uh, remember, the construction investment on a major facility like that um, would be in the neighborhood of fifty to sixty million dollars. So um, you're talking, you know, the equivalent to like 
the apartments at Lakeway Commons, like, you know, something like that. So significant amount of money, you know, certainly several hundred thousands, not more than a half a million dollars uh, in revenue to the town. Yeah. So it's a good thing. It is a good thing, yeah. And that property actually abuts Route 70 and Does. is close to um, 290. 290. Yeah. So it's not as if those trucks are going yeah. to need to drive through town to get where they need to be. Right. Most likely they're going to jump on the high, one of those highways. Right. I mean, what would be better would be that same square foot of a building and it'd be a high-end office space or, you know, manufacturing facility right. where on top of that shell of a building you would have a lot of equipment inside that would also be taxed for personal property. You know, it would just drive up, you know, the total tax revenue. But, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it's not another residential development. It provides jobs. So it has a, a number of more benefits. And it's than on just the taxes. outer edge of town. So it's not right. plopped right in the middle of town. Right. Where you're going to see all Contributing to town center traffic right. like some exactly. of the current facilities do. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, now, the police have had um, arrests that have been in the paper lately and three that come to mind mm -hmm. um, in recent times and they're all traffic stops with they're finding drugs and weapons which is very dangerous mm -hmm. and very good that they've been able to catch them mm -hmm. um, and, and the people arrested aren't all from far away some of them are from clo towns closer by mm -hmm. um, so um, what, how does that contribute to the needs of the police department? I think what you're seeing is two things. One, we're reporting more about what we do from an activity standpoint. Mm -hmm. But uh, the other part is, is there's just, as it's known, is more calls for service and patrol-oriented calls for services where, you know, officers are out observing and noticing things that, you know, are leading to this type of arrest and acquisition of drugs and weapons and things like that. Um, it shows the need for having a sufficient number of officers on every staff. You know, the more likelihood that stop is going to result in an activity like this and an incident like this, the more you want two or three officers at the scene to be safe. You're pulling a vehicle over, you're a single officer, there's three adult males inside with three or four weapons you know you don't want to be the only one that's mm -hmm. able to respond so um, I think it it's twofold you know it's not necessarily an uptick in this type of activity but maybe we're spotting it better but we're certainly reporting it out more um, so it's probably happened right along and we just don't know it yeah Is that what you're but I think it's mutually beneficial want it you know for those paying attention, you don't want to drive through Shrewsbury, you know, with this type of activity going on in your vehicle. And, and two, we're illustrating how we're spending our taxpayer dollars. More and more. as we talk about this, the we're adding three police officers this year: right. one sergeant and two, sergeant two and patrol. two patrolmen. Right. So um, that's not that's not outside of what you had for a plan. That's that's just going along with what the police department can handle as new offices in any given time Correct. because of the training and so forth. Do you mm -hmm. want to talk about that at all? Yeah, I mean, it, we, it would could provide an opportunity if we get the full staffing with those three officers to have uh, one officer a day dedicated to traffic. Um, so not one officer per shift, but one officer per day. And then the other one would just be to um, because of general call volume and overall shift levels, you know, adding an additional office officer uh, to the overnight shift, <clears throat> where you know we continue to see calls. So it it gets us there. I mean, if you look at the FBI statistics, we're still way off on per capita. Ratio. Meaning we should have an awful lot more. Yeah, we should have not double, but 50% more officers, and that's not necessarily what we're trying to get to just on a statistics level, but we are. Uh, seeing a continued increase in the in the call volume and um, you know the increase is certainly justified is yeah, what you're saying absolutely so um, and the sergeant why do you need another sergeant one of the main drivers behind this the sergeant's position um, is uh, the administrative aspects associated with post which is the new peace officer standards at the state 
and the data and documentation that we're going to have to have on how we train our officers, the certifications that our officers have, how we respond to internal affairs, uh, uh, investigations, external complaints. That, you know, post really, really shifted the, the um, benefit of the doubt, you know, away from the police and towards the citizen. So we are gonna have to be much more diligent and detailed in all those things to ensure that the hard work of our officers and training of our officers is documented so that when they act in the field, it's justified. So if it's not, then we'd have to take disciplinary action, you know, but um, it's one of the main focuses of this sergeant. Um, we did increase our sergeant levels, you know, um, last year as well in preparation for body cams and the administrative aspects associated with, with that program and we're nearing uh, the implementation of a body cam program uh, it will be in effect this summer so we have funding in place for body cameras um, we're finalizing a policy we're waiting for state guidance on a body camera policy from post again police officers as uh, peace officers standards uh, which is the certification at the state and uh, we will then implement and put them into place um, like the city of Worcester they will be used in coordination with uh, cameras on tasers so all, we're actually increasing our taser deployment to all officers now as well those tasers will have cameras on them so as soon as they're pulled from their holster they'll begin to record so you know in some instances each officer will have two points of view um, that's recorded and documented as to what their activities are in the field so and as you're talking I'm thinking technology technology you also have um, an added position in the fire department where you have someone I can't remember what it what the title of it is but someone who's working to control and and do all the work with radios yeah. it's almost like you have to have specialists for um, all keeping up with all the technology yeah. that comes along yeah you really have to uh, you know on the on the fire side of things uh, that position that we're considering would be to manage all public safety radios um, you know it's a computer-based system each assigned radio each radio is assigned it's not like you grab one off the shelf so I know it's officer ABC that has radio one two three that's very important, you know, on both the police and si fire side to make sure those things are managed. It's all computer-based system, so it needs updates, it needs patches, it needs to be cyber secure, all those things that we could possibly do with these systems. So the technology benefits us, and then it makes us more vulnerable in some ways as well. Um, but on the police side, the management of the volume of public records, once you have a body camera system, you know, an officer's on shift for eight hours, and conceivably that camera could be on seven of the eight hours, right? Only turned off in certain justified through policy circumstances, including if we ever come visit someone at their home for a medical or just have a conversation with them before we enter that home, they'd be able to say, can you please turn your camera off? Off. And the officer, that would be on camera, and the officer would turn it off, yeah. So. Wow. So that's the citizen's right to say that? Yep, under certain circumstances. Oh, yeah. yeah. So how would they know when they have the right and when they, when they don't? Well, the officer will tell them that oh. they're being recorded. Oh. I'm about to enter your home. Okay. Yep. Um, so hexavalent chromium in our water. How are the levels these days? So since that original study, they're a little bit lower than they were when, when you know, it first came through. Um, they're, they average, you know, anywhere from, say, six to eight parts per billion, and um, that's really low. You know, the, the federal EPA standard is 100 parts per billion. You can't exceed 100 parts per billion of total chromium. California is trying to implement a new standard. They tried a couple years ago. They, they just recently... Um, at the beginning of the year try are starting to work legislation through their state legislature to set a standard of 10 parts per billion that you can't exceed 10 parts per billion so we're still half of 
what may be the California standard, and we all know California on environmental issues is way out there ahead of you know most other states and countries in the world for that matter. So um, it's still we're at a very low level, and um, there was a presentation to the board of selectmen a couple of weeks ago about that. If anyone's interested about the piloting, the the effectiveness of a piloting study and what those results could be, it's a massive investment. You know that we would have to undertake basically constructing a new treatment plant beside the current one to address hexavalent chromium so it's a 10 plus million dollar endeavor um is that going to happen no it, it's not worth it because we're our levels are so low again even if the california standard goes into place we're half of that standard only 50 percent of that standard so why invest uh, you know, 10 or 11 million dollars, an additional million dollars in operations to try to get it from five parts per billion to four parts per billion when 10 or actually right now 100 is a standard. So we don't see that as a prudent investment. Opportunistically in the future, as we look at treating things like PFOS and maybe other future contaminants that we identify, because I don't think these will be the last ones, right? There it we may be able to treat hexavalent chromium along with it, but it doesn't, it, it, with it being so low, it doesn't, you know, seem Just to rise. refresh to everyone's memory about the hexavalent chromium and yep. how we get it in our environment in the first place. All right, so some of it is naturally occurring, but that's main, mainly in the west, western part of the country. This was likely from some type of heavy industrial activity like uh, stainless steel welding or uh, plating of metals, coating of metals. Uh, so it's a very heavy, uh, heavier than water. Um, so this somehow got into uh, the groundwater. Um, but it looks like the plume is has very little impact on our water supplies. Where we sunk the wells to test for it once it showed up a little bit on our wells was much higher, but our wells are not pulling water in from that area of town. What certain wells? Did that happen in? So the test wells were put in basically at the property line of the water treatment plant and uh, what was met so. So if you think of that and you think of what was west of, mm -hmm. I think it's west, mm -hmm. of um, the water treatment plant and the wells over yep. there, there were several businesses yeah, over there. Plating. Garrapy plating. Yep. The, the, what was that? I always I have a memory block. There was a place where they did like film mm. o over. Okay. It's gone now, but it was over that way, and they used to just dump the stuff into the brook. Mm -hmm. So, um, would they admit to stuff like that? Probably not. But um, right. that's what people used to say b back then, and it wasn't. I mean, it was probably 30, 40 years ago now. But uh, there were plenty of causes over there. Those things are gone. Right. So is there a way to see, to test the soil for the back, you know? Yeah, we are, minutes? yeah. Well, actually the DEP is on behalf of the town and trying to identify um, the problem. Um, it is the same group of DEP that have been focused over the last 24 months on PFAS, so mm -hmm. they, they only have so much staffing. And since, again, our levels are so low, it's not... We're not their priority. Yeah, it's not the priority. But they do have test wells way up Plantation Street in the city of Worcester, and they've asked certain property owners for more information and more access to their property, which they're working through on them. Environmental laws require that you know, there's liability to the current owner of the property if there's pollution on it, regardless right. if they were the one that put it there or not. Yeah. So. And now we should touch upon Community Preservation Committee mm -hmm. because you hear CPC and you go, now what does that stand mm -hmm. for? But it's the Com Community Preservation Committee and they have a plan. And what, what are their priorities and what, what are their plans? Right, so they're in the, the, they're first charged with developing this plan that you're talking about. So they're, They've had a two-pronged process so far. They're going around to various boards and committees, the board of selectmen, uh, planning department, et cetera, and gathering input from those groups and says, you know, the state law says we fund affordable housing, historic preservation, and open space and recreation. Um, what are your priorities in these areas? So they're gathering that feedback. They had an open public forum last week. 
70, 100 residents attended and provided their own you know, personal feedback. Um, and now the CPC is taking that information, developing its annual priority plan, and it will begin to receive applications this coming fall that may be funded or would be asked for funding at the May 2023 annual town meeting. At this town meeting, we're actually going to, um, move statutory, in compliance with statute, move funds into those various buckets from the revenue that we've received so far and will receive in fiscal year 23. So people pay taxes and part of that money goes towards this plan. Mm -hmm. Who controls where that money gets used so is it the committee is it the selectmen is it the town manager who controls and says okay this is what we're going to do first who controls that so it's a multi-part process but ultimately town meeting is still the appropriating right. authority right so but, but before you get yeah. to town meeting who who's really driving that so the cpc will recommend warrant articles for the board of selectmen to include on the warrant so it's really the, the CPC who will receive the applications, compare it against the, prior, the plan, the priorities that they put in place, and make funding recommendations based on the funds that they have, um, both in total and those individual buckets where they're set aside. Now, it will be my preference to have staff in those affiliated and associated areas like parks and recreation and open space and planning and, um, affordable housing engage with um, the CPC to have some town staff oriented applications and then also to the extent that we can and have available time support individual citizens who may have an application um, that comes in so who applies is not limited it can be groups within town individuals within town but it has to pass through the community preservation committee and get their recommendation um, make it onto the warrant and then have town meeting approve it to get the funding. And they've put in a lot of time just getting organized because mm -hmm. they needed to. Yes. But I mean, it's very time consuming just to get up and running. Mm -hmm. So, um, and people. And that, will ben that will benefit us as well because we'll have a little bit of, a little more money on hand at the beginning to meet some of those maybe bigger priorities that we just haven't got to. Um, it will be really will be for those areas of affordable housing, historic preservation, and parks and recreation, open space will be unprecedented amount of funding that's available for projects in those areas. I have four more pages of questions, but time's up. We've had a fast hour. Um, hope you enjoyed the show. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.